Okay, thanks, Alan. Um, I guess what I'm trying to get over, or a message I'm trying to get over today is really how work on trout can uh, benefit salmon. So if we can move on to the next slide, please. Um, OK, um, I guess uh, the point being, in, they might be termed troublesome in the fact that they are pretty much everywhere, um, a larger range than salmon uh, being present in our upper catchments, headwaters, hill locks, whatever we want to call them, all the way down through our river systems and into the marine inshore environment. So um, that kind of spread can create uh, problems really for regulation, particularly in terms of um, one species, the brown trout being considered in fisheries law as different from the sea run fish from a resident fish. And obviously much of the work we do within trust and fishery boards is um, is undertaken on its glamorous cousin, the Atlantic salmon. So really we're not, I don't believe we're doing enough um, to, to learn about the secrets of trout and how work on trout can benefit salmon. And indeed our, our most recent sort of uh, endeavours in acoustic tracking of salmon smolts have shown trout to be a possible likely suspect in the, the low numbers of, uh, uh, of salmon smolts reaching uh, our estuaries. But we can argue really that both the trout and its habitats are more susceptible to climate change than salmon habitat. And so by doing more work on trout, we can better understand what the effects might be of climate change on Atlantic salmon. OK, uh, next slide, please. So just to maybe uh, as some contrast, we're going to start in the brown trout sort of far northwest range in in Iceland. Where it's perceived really by many that um, Iceland is is trout heaven. And um, by looking at the conditions in Iceland, we can see where um, trout thrive. And we see that really the relationship between the, the landscape and the geology uh, and the climate has all been shaped by recent ice ages. So we have, um, uh, if you like, once the ice started to uh, uh, draw back from our, our landscape as the climate warmed, we see that part of that landscape actually started to lift and we have the waterfall barriers that we see on many of our rivers. And that separated out those uh, trout into the higher altitudes where we have resident populations today. But the contrast I'd like to point out really in the two countries, Iceland and Scotland, is the geology. The geology of um, Iceland being very different. It's a very new landscape. Um, produced by uh, volcanic activity and the actual geology is very rich, very young, lots of minerals. We could compare that with Scotland, our rock types are very old and worn out if you like, and so we don't have that same amount of in-stream productivity generated by rich rocks. Therefore, we can argue that the riparian productivity, which we don't really have in Iceland, you can see by this landscape here in this picture, um, that we do have some more productivity in riparian habitats in Scotland, and that's our key in terms of maintaining our trout populations that we have good riparian habitats because we don't have that inbuilt uh, in-stream productivity. OK, let's move on, please. Now. Next slide, please. One of the roles of temperature was highlighted to me. Again, this is in, in Iceland. This is a, a very fat, healthy sea trout, which any normal minded angler on the west coast of Scotland would have returned directly to the water. But here, this fish was caught in the north of Iceland and we were actually had to kill this fish. The reason for that is it was caught in a river is actually known for its sea run Arctic char. And so this is a sort of a signature really of climate change in the far north of Iceland, where we see trout starting to move into the very cold waters which have been um, prioritised for Arctic char. And we know from, from studies done on the thermal characteristics or, or 
or preferences for different salmonids, the Arctic char love that really cold water and not far behind it become come the, the brown trout that like the, the cool water and then uh, the less tolerant to cold water is Atlantic salmon. So really we see a difference between trout and salmon of about three degrees centigrade between their, their kind of minimums and maximums of, uh, of when they thrive. Next slide please. So returning to Scotland, um, all the biologists here will know that if we went electrofishing in this tributary stream here, we are more likely to find trout than salmon. Trout very much preferring these smaller watercourses for spawning and nursery habitat. But also we see from recent work done by Marine Scotland in the stream temperature monitoring network, that these tributaries, particularly in the upper catchments, are more susceptible to climate change. So we have both a more susceptible uh, brown trout and a more susceptible habitat um, to climate change. So really these tributaries are key um, for our kind of making habitats more robust uh, in the face of climate change in terms of protecting salmon also further down the catchment. And this particular uh, uh, picture shows a recently clearfield, forestry clearfield section of river. And in conversation with foresters about how we might go ahead in restoring this, uh, this habitat after those trees have been taken out, there is nothing we can find in current forestry planning that will actually allow us to go and replant these uh, streams with broad leaves as a matter of course. So this ground will be replanted with conifers, but there will be no active management of the riparian zone. So these conifer streams within the current management are being left really to their own devices. And also we have to think about deer management. The uh, forest is well aware of the high numbers of deer uh, in, our, in our uplands. And they are indeed in conflict between uh, fish uh, management and land management. And so deer management is going to be key in the future in actually restoring uh, uh, these upland habitats. Another thing we all need to think about with these smaller tributaries is the much lower level of protection they get within our, uh, our, our protection agencies in terms of the general binding rules and car licensing system, anything under a metre has a much lower level of protection and land users can do uh, many more activities to promote drainage uh, on these smaller streams. Next slide, please. And this is a, a lower altitude stream, um, really, which is actually one of our streams that we're going to be working on uh, with funds from the uh, Wild Salmon Support Fund. There obviously there's this conflict between the way that a fisheries biologist would see this stream and the way that a farmer would see it. Is it a, a trout nursery or is it just a drain? So uh, this project is really is aiming to, to change perceptions of farmers in the way that they look at these smaller watercourses. Because indeed when we did a survey on this insignificant looking uh, watercourse, we did find trout fry and indeed in the autumn we did see sea trout trying to use this stream uh, as a spawning habitat. So really, I think these things point out that there is um, sector specific funding required to actually enhance or improve the management of these smaller watercourses rather than, than allow them to be um, ongoingly used as, the, as these straightened ditches. OK, next slide, please. We also maybe need to look at our, our juvenile surveys. We've had some excellent work done now with through the National Electrofishing Programme, um, which is very much salmon focused as, as our, 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 our conservation limits um, for salmon. Really, we need to argue that we should include trout in this process so we better get a better handle on these very susceptible habitats and a more susceptible species in brown trout in terms of actually identifying the early problems where they are occur occurring for salmon. 
Next slide, please. And indeed, we could also argue the same for barriers. In these smaller streams further up the catchment, which are used by trout, uh, they, they haven't really come up on the uh, Water uh, Environment Fund list of priorities uh, to date. Um, and these kind of barriers are indeed um, having an impact on brown trout. Next slide, please. There was a, uh, a happy accident, if you like, uh, on this stream where a hydro developer actually managed to pollute it. And as part of the mitigation, we asked them to use their machinery on site to remove that particular structure. And the graph here shows you in 2015 that we had approximately 10 trout per 100 meters squared. And after the removal of that structure two years later, we had a, an eightfold increase in the, in the number of trout present. And I think that has a very stark reminder of, of how these habitats are important, not just for trout, but also for wider biodiversity is obviously the the um, uh, the birds and the, the mammals that, that benefit from having healthy trout populations in these in these upper areas. Next slide, please. And one thing about the the ice, uh, the ice age is shaping our trout populations. They left us with some a very diverse range or genetic range or variation of 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 trout populations in Scotland. And many of those um, of populations are, have adapted to their own unique environments in their own ways. So we have very different life strategies present uh, across our, our, our river networks. So we do actually have what well, we have through genetic analysis shown that we do have some very unique uh, trout populations which, which are worthy of protection. This picture here shows a, a large ferox brown trout. This one is from, from Loch Orr, and it is genetically distinct from the brown trout, the other brown trout, which are non ferox, which are present in the same catchment. And that's um, been shown in some other waters as well, where these fish, these, uh, these ancestral type trout, have more char characteristics genetically in, uh, uh, similar to other ferox in, in other lochs across Scotland. Next slide, please. The problem is we know very little about these fish. And if we want to protect that genetic diversity, we need to do much more in terms of understanding what the needs are for these rarer elements of, 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 of the trout populations. So again, we took it on ourselves really to try to understand about the population sizes of these uh, uh, of these ferox trout. The, through mark, um, mark and recapture studies, we're able to determine that these fish really only occur in very low numbers. The graph there shows over a four year period, we estimated that that population might range between over 300 fish in that lock and 80 fish at its lowest point. And so when you consider these habitats are very large, we were looking at one ferox per the equivalent of 50 um, football fields in terms of size, so very low density of fish. And we know from their size that actually um, the, the, the food availability wasn't the problem. Perhaps that the, the recruitment uh, of, of, of ferox trout might be the issue limiting their small population. OK, next slide, please. And this is where really we come into uh, a, a common problem between trout and salmon, as many of our lock systems have uh, barrages on the outflow. And while there are a kind of measures in place to allow smolts to pass downstream in the spring, there aren't necessarily um, uh, measures in place to allow these ferox brown trout downstream to spawn in the autumn. So really, we need to do a lot more work um, looking at the, the outflow spawners and also incorporating uh, spawning flows into uh, regulated flow regimes. There's not only the, the, the old school uh, hydro developments, we've also seen a large increase in the, the sort of small scale 
hydro screen de development, sediment supply really will need to be factored in over the longer term. So again, we need to do more work in relation to studying uh, the effect of home hydro over the longer term. Next slide, please. We're moving further down the catchment from the headwaters down in towards the, the marine environment. And we've also already touched on this in terms of the, the, the potential for new regulation regime of uh, 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 of trying to protect salmon migration routes in the marine. We also have sea trout present in these environments all year round. But it's work on sea trout really that's informing the issues for salmon. So this, this prospective improved regulation uh, of sea lice in the marine environment really is primarily to designed to protect salmon, but um, we also know uh, from the issues that we've been seeing in our monitoring that, that there are there are big issues for sea trout. So the kind of larger sea trout that we see in the picture here are, are relatively rare um, to us in both the fisheries and our, and our monitoring. Next slide, please, Anna. So where we do our monitoring, we can see from the the graph on the left hand side here, those red bars indicate very a very high risk um, to, to sea trout from the sea lice burden. And we can note really from the, the pattern of those high risks, that they occur every second year. And those second year high risk years for sea trout are in relation to the second year of um, of, of farm salmon production when the sea lice numbers on those farms are usually at their highest. So we see that relationship between the salmon farming and that higher risk of uh, 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 to, to sea trout. But this does relate to salmon in a way that where we monitor at this site, the West Coast Salmon Tracking Project has shown that salmon smolts do spend time here in this particular environment and where they are also susceptible to becoming infested by sea lice. So again, we can see how the work on salmon uh, is actually showing um, benefit to trout and trout work on trout benefiting salmon in the longer term. OK, next slide, please, Alan. So just to cap off, really, because trout are so widespread, we need to engage you know, a wider sector of of land users and also water, water resource users. We also need that balanced regulation uh, to benefit both the economy and biodiversity. We need to maximise the benefits of measures aimed at Atlantic salmon to benefit trout. And also we need to protect those tributaries uh, where, where trout occur, which have wider benefits going forward uh, for salmon in the future, because obviously the trout are a key indicator of climate change. OK, that's me, Alan. Thank you.